like to welcome and greet all participants with heartfelt feelings. I would like to also thank the organizers of this important conference. My dear friend Tunç Soyer, Mayor of Izmir Metropolitan Municipality and distinguished authorities of the clinic. After one and a half years with COVID-19, we can easily tell the following. The world was caught off guard with this pandemic. This is actually surprising because the pandemic was not a surprise. On the contrary, it was something to which scientists had been drawing attention for quite a long time, for which they were recommending suggestions. It was a close and serious risk. Despite this, no country or institution was ready enough for it. It looks like the humanity has not yet completely internalized a govern governmental or political understanding based on science and it has not yet applied such an understanding in a complete sense. With the pandemic leaders in many places around the world have shown significant determination to walk on the path where scientists have been pointing, even though they were a little bit late. We have seen that such leaders have made very wrong decisions and so over time lost reputation and power. In situations where public authorities do not behave responsibly and seriously as the pandemic would require, the whole burden had to rest on the shoulders of healthcare professionals. We owe a lot to them. I hope that everyone has seen and understood that one of the most important elements of the struggle against this pandemic is to not make healthcare professionals feel burned out, unhappy or helpless. As its name goes, pandemic is a global problem. But do, during this period, we have seen that the national dimension of the struggle against the pandemic is as important as, or maybe is more important than its global dimension. In order for a public health measure to be effectively implemented and for any social policy developed against the pandemic to be successful, they need to be first and foremost localized. If local particularities and sensitivities are not taken into account, if institutional and actual local dynamics are not taken into account, it is not possible to succeed in the fight against the pandemic. The closest managerial units to the public need should be given authority and empowered in order to succeed against traits that the pandemic has made to human health, security and welfare, cent central and local authorities should stay outside all daily politics and power struggle and should have full cooperation. As Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality, we always paid attention to this and we clung on to three concepts in order to correctly manage the multi-dimensional and complex process of this pandemic. These concepts are planning, coordination and transparency. When you are fighting against the pandemic, you should plan all steps and possible outcomes together. 
and manage the process so that all related institutions come together under maximum coordination. During this pandemic, where bad management costs human health and life, where each wrong decision can cause very serious outcomes, no one has the right to behave arbitrarily and say, I and only I know what is best. Transparency is key during all this process in order for right decisions to be taken. Transparency is a matter of life or death during this pandemic and the getting away from it can prove to be as deadly as the virus itself. As a matter of fact, I cannot say that the extent to which we care about planning, coordination and transparency, the sensitivity we have in that regards is not shared by all the institutions of the state. Despite this, as local authorities, we have done very valuable work, not only in Istanbul, but in many parts of Turkey during the pandemic. We cannot even count one by one what we have done only Istanbul and what we are still doing. We have broken new ground in many areas, ranging from measures taken to facilitate the lives of healthcare workers to developing new and unique social solidarity models. I would like to particularly highlight one of them. We took the first step and buttoned up the first button in a correct manner. Right after the very first case of coronavirus was announced in our country on 11 March 2020, we set up the scientific advisory board of Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality. However, just as it takes to have scientific competence and expertise to become a member of scientific advisory board, it should be also a matter of expertise to elect the members of that board. That's why we first identified relevant professional chambers and associations which would be able to come up with solutions to the main problems and we demanded formal representatives from them because it is professionals themselves who work in a certain field who know the most reputed people in that particular profession. Therefore, the composition of the scientific advisory board of Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality was not determined by us, but rather by such institutions as the Turkish Medical Association, Chamber of Pharmacists, Association of Public Health, and the Turkish Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infect Infectious Diseases. We made an effort to do everything in our power in the best way, following the suggestions of our scientific advisory board, because that was the right thing to do. A Turkish proverb says, a misfortune is worth more than a thousand pieces of advice. I hope that despite everything, the humanity has taken relevant lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope that the new normal of our world will be shaped by humanism, tolerance, and the solidarity in the light of science. Hepinizi Antalya'mızdan sevgi ve saygıyla selamlıyorum. Öncelikle bu önemli buluşmayı organize ederek bizlere fikir alışverişi yapma imkanı sağlayan sevgili dostum 
İzmir Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımız Tunç Soyer'e, Bulaşı Hastalıkları Önleme Derneği'ne ve Türk Klinik Mikrobiyoloji ve İnfeksiyon Hastalıkları Derneği'ne teşekkür ediyorum. Neredeyse iki yıldır bir hastalığın, bir virüsün dünyamızı ne hale getirdiğine hepimiz tanık olduk. İnsanlar hayatlarını kaybetti. Sağlık sektörü dünyanın birçok yerinde çökme noktasına geldi. İnsanların birbirleriyle ilişkileri mecburi olarak koptu. Ekonomiler ağır yaralandı. Türkiye'mizde elbette yaşanan bu küresel salgından payını aldı. Özellikle ülkemizin turizm başkenti olan Antalya'da da pandeminin ciddi etkilerini yaşadık. Vatandaşlarımızın ciddi bir bölümünü turizmden doğrudan ya da dolaylı olarak kazanç elde ediyor. Seyahat yasakları, sokağa çıkma kısıtlamaları Antalya'mızı ciddi olarak etkiledi. Elbette böyle zamanlarda halkımızın güvenerek seçtiği insanlar olarak sorumluluk almak zorundayız. İlk olarak virüsün yayılmasını önleyici aksiyonlar almaya başladık. Bildiğiniz gibi halkımız maskeye ulaşmakta zorluk çekiyordu. Hemen Antalya Büyükşehir Belediyesi'nin dikim atölyelerini devreye soktuk ve seri maske üretimine başladık. Duraklarda, meydanlarda, kamu kurumlarında, pazarlarda dağıtımına başlayarak halkımızı maskesiz bırakmadık. Ardından yine belediyemiz bünyesinde hijyen ekibi oluşturduk. Tüm toplu taşıma araçları, kamusal alanlar, parklar, camiler gibi insanlarımızın bir araya geldiği yerler düzenli olarak dezenfekte edilmeye başlandı. Aynı şekilde kuaförler başta olmak üzere esnafımızın da iş yerlerinde ekiplerimizle ücretsiz hijyen çalışmaları yaptık. Vatandaşlarımızın çalışmadığı, evlerine ekmek götürmekte zorlandığı dönemde bir de su faturası yüzünden zorluk yaşanmasını istemedik. Özellikle insanlara sürekli temizliğin çok önemli olduğu söylenirken kimsenin borcundan dolayı suyunun kesilmesine izin vermedik. Ayrıca dayanışmayı büyütmek adına askıda fatura kampanyası başlattık. Veren el, alan eli görmeden hayırsever vatandaşlarımız zor durumda olan binlerce vatandaşımızın su faturasını ödedi. Elbette Halkçı belediyecilik anlayışımız gereği sadece önleyici uygulamalarla hizmetlerimizi sınırlamadık. Her kesimden insanımıza ben sen öteki ayrımı yapmadan acil ve hayati ihtiyaçları yüz binden fazla gıda kolisine ihtiyaç sahibi vatandaşlarımızı yine onları rencide etmeden kapılarına götürdük. Okullarından uzaktan kalan çocuklarımız için çözüm üretmek zorundaydık. Gereken cihaza sahip olmadığı için İnternete giremeyen, çevrimiçi derslerini takip edemeyen çocuklarımıza tablet ulaştırdık. Liselere ve üniversiteye giriş sınavına hazırlanan evlatlarımız için çevrimiçi sınavlar düzenledik. Evde bakım hizmetimizle yaşlı, engelli, ihtiyaç sahibi ve bakıma muhtaç hemşerilerimizi yalnız bırakmadık. Tabi tüm bu hizmetleri verirken kendi çalışma arkadaşlarımızın da güvenliğini unutmadık. Esnek çalışma ve dönüşümlü çalışma sistemiyle hem hizmetlerin aksamamasını hem de personelimizin salgından korunmasını sağlamaya çalıştık. Şimdi kontrollü olarak normalleşme dönemine giriyoruz. Kısıtlamalar birer birer ortadan kalkıyor. Bence hem yerel yönetimler hem de vatandaşlar olarak üstümüze düşen görev daha da artıyor. Antalya Büyükşehir Belediyesi olarak bir daha kentimizin ve ülkemizin aynı zorlukları yaşanması için gerekli tedbir ve düzenlemelere devam ediyoruz. Özellikle sahillerimiz de dahil olmak üzere insanların toplu olarak bulunduğu yerlerde sosyal mesafe düzenlemeleri, hijyen çalışmalarımızı hız kesmeden devam ediyor, sosyal ve kültürel etkinliklerimizi de bu anlayışa uygun düzenliyoruz. Örneğin sahilde sosyal mesafeye uygun, Sinema gibi. Hemşehrilerimizin bir daha o zorlu günleri yaşamaması için yetkimiz çerçevesinde elimizden gelen her şeyi yapmak zorundayız. Çünkü toplum olarak hem ekonomik hem de psikolojik olarak çok zorlandığımız bir dönem geçirdik. Hastalık yüzünden hayatını kaybeden, yakınlarını kaybeden, işini kaybeden insanlarımız var. 
Bunlar kolay şeyler değil. Vatandaşlarımıza destek olmak zorundayız. Yerel yönetimler olarak aldığımız tedbirleri kesinlikle gevşetmememiz gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Halkımızın hafızasını da canlı tutmak önemli. Çünkü kontrolsüzce tüm önlemleri bırakırsak kısa sürede aynı şeyleri yeniden yaşamak zorunda kalabiliriz. Kendimizi hızla toplamak ve hayata devam edebilmek için fikir alışverişi yapmayı da çok önemsiyorum. Bu anlamda gerçekleştirdiğimiz bu toplantının çok faydalı olacağını düşünüyorum. Benim her zaman söylediğim bir söz var. Ben, sen yok, biz varız. Biz birlikte yaparız. Bugün burada gerçekleştirdiğimizde tam olarak bu. Deneyimlerimizi, yaptığımız uygulamaları paylaşarak birbirimizden fikir almak, yerel yönetimlerde sorumluluk alan bizler için hemşehrilerimize sunduğumuz hizmetin kalitesini yükseltecektir. Hepinizi Türkiye'nin turizm başkenti Antalya'mızdan sevgiyle ve saygıyla selamlıyorum. Halkçı anlayışla çalışan tüm belediye başkanı dostlarıma kolaylıklar diliyorum. Beni dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ediyorum. Dünya Pandemi Konferansı'nda sizlerle olmaktan e, duyduğu mutluluğu ifade etmek istiyorum. E, organize eden herkese, kıymetli başkana, değerli katılımcıları sevgi ve saygıyla selamlıyorum. Gaziantep Büyükşehir Belediyesi olarak, e, başkan olarak biz ve arkadaşlarımız pandemiyle birlikte e, hem pandemide halkımızın en az zararla çıkması, e, hem de pandemiden sonra kurulacak yeni dünyaya, Hazırlıklı olmak için büyük bir gayret gösterdik. İki bacaklı çalıştık. Özellikle pandemi sürecinde genel genelgelerin ete kemiğe bürünmesi, uygulamalarda şehrin koordine edilmesi açısından önemli bir çalışmaydı. Valimiz de Hıfzı Sıra Kurulu pandemi kurullarıyla oradan çıkan kararlarda en büyük desteği lojistik olarak, büyük şehir olarak biz verdik. Bir taraftan şehrin ekonomisini, sanayi şehrinin devam etmesini, bir taraftan da şehrin sağlıklı bir şekilde ekonomisini devam ettirmek için olağanüstü tedbirler aldık. Sanayimizde yaptığımız eğitim ve denetim çalışmalarıyla işçilerimizin sağlıklı ortam üretim yapmalarını sağlayacak toplu alanlarda yemek olsun, burada toplu alanlarda yapılan çalışmalarda orada aile hekimleriyle, iş yeri hekimleriyle güzel bir çalışma yaptık ve bugün geldiğimiz noktada bu çalışmaların ne kadar önemli olduğunu görüyoruz. Bir taraftan da ihracatımızı yükselterek büyümeye devam edip bir taraftan rakamlarımızı düşürerek sağlıklı ve güvenli bir şehir olma konusundaki iddiamızı devam ettirdik. Diğer taraftan tabi sağlıklı şehirde akıllı şehir çok önemliydi. Dijital uygulamalar çok önemliydi. Akıllı ulaş, şehirde akıllı ulaşım en önemli başlıktı. Toplu taşımaları güvenli ve sağlıklı hale dönüştürmemiz gerekiyordu. 2017 yılında başlatmış olduğumuz güvenli ulaşım, akıllı ulaşım altyapısının yazılım ve donanım altyapısı ne kadar güçlü olduğunu göstermek açısından elimize büyük bir fırsat oldu. Bilişim AŞ'nin kendi hazırladığı yerli ve milli yazılımlarıyla HES kodu bağlantısını sağladık ve Toplu taşımak için otobüse, tramvaya binmek için gelenlerin e, temaslı mı, şüpheli mi, e, pozitif mi olduğunu e, bakıp eğer bunların herhangi biri varsa da Gaziantep kartı iptal ettirerek otobüse binmesini engelledik. Bu da yine Türkiye'de yapılan önemli çalışmalardan bir tanesiydi. Örnek bir çalışma oldu. Diğer taraftan baktığımız zaman özellikle sağlık çalışanlarımız bu süreçte en çok yorulan, en çok fedakarlık gösteren grup oldu. Onlara müteşekkiriz. Onların ulaşım desteğinden istemiş oldukları daha sağlıklı şarkılarda çalışmalarını etkileyecek sağlık paketlerine kadar kuvvetli bir çalışma yaptık. Hazırlamış olduğumuz tarım okulunda ürettiğimiz içinde C ve D vitamini, çinko ve manezyum ağırlıklı olan bütün ürünlerimizi bir şifa paketi hazırlayarak onlara gönderdik. Bu ürünlerin içerisinde bir taraftan arabanın sarımsağı vardı, diğer taraftan istahiyenin biberi vardı, bunların Oğuz Eli'nin narı vardı. Bunlar bilim kurulundan daha çok tüketilmesi gereken gıdalar olarak bize söylenince biz kendi ürettiğimiz bu paketleri hemen sağlık çalışanlarımıza gönderdik. Koronalı hastaların evine 
şifa paketi olarak gönderdik. Diğer taraftan eğitim en çok etkilenen birimlerden biriydi. Çocuklarımızın güvenli şartlarda okul hayatına devam ettirmesi için güvenli okul projesini destekledik. Dağıttığımız maskeler, sıvı deterjanlar, dezenfekteler, stikerler okulun güvenli hale gelmesini sağladı. Bahçesinde ailelere ve çocuklara yaptığımız eğitimlerle bu sertifika programının altyapısını oluşturduk. Tabletler dağıttık. Yaklaşık 100 bin tableti şehrimizde bunu bu işe alamayacak daha yoksul çocukların, yetim çocukların, mülteci çocukların buna ulaşmasını sağladık. Kırsal bölgede kiraladığımız uydularla internete ulaşmalarını sağladık. Eğitimden sağla baktığınız zaman ulaşımdan çevreye bu alanda çok önemli çalışmaları yaparken burası aynı zamanda bir şehir ekonomisi olarak bağladığınız zaman kültürel turizmin, gastronominin başkenti, lezzetin başkenti. Lokantalarımızda her yer fıstık gibi, her şey fıstık gibi bir sertifika programı açtık. Lokantalarımızın tek kullanımlıktan QR koda geçerek menülerini okutacağı, burada masa düzeninden, buradaki hizmet veren garsonlarımızın eğitimine kadar önemli bir çalışma yaptık. Bu sertifikayı alan bütün lokantalarımızı biz yerinde ziyaret ettik. Her yer fıstık gibi, her şey fıstık gibi çalışmasını yerinde halkımızla paylaştık. Yeni trendte kültürel turizm nereye gidiyor? Deyince karavan turizminin yeni dönemde yükselen bir değer olduğunu, kanyon turizminin talep edildiğini, yere, yerindelik, yerellik, deneyimlemenin ne kadar önemli olduğunu gördük. Bu alanda yaptığımız çalışmayla da şehrimizi pandemiden sonra ki yeni öncelikleri hazırladık. Ekonomiden ekolojiye nasıl geçeceğiz? Yeşil şehirleri nasıl çalıştıracağız? Akıllı şehirleri nasıl çalıştıracağız? Güvenli ve sağlıklı şehir nasıl olacağız? Bütün çalışmaları tamamladık, halkımızla paylaştık. Bu konuda buna en hazır şehir olarak huzurlarınızdayız. Kongremizin hayırlı uğurlu olmasını diliyorum. Hazırlayan ve bu organizeyi yapan herkese çok teşekkür ediyorum. Bizi davet ettiğiniz için de hepinize selamlarımı, hürmetlerimi iletiyorum. Kongrenin başarılı geçmesini diliyor. Çıkan çıktıların da Türkiye Belediyeler Birliği Başkanı olarak da yakın takipçisi olacağım ifade ediyor. Hepinizi sevgiyle, hürmetle selamlıyorum. This is a message for the World Pandemic Congress. The municipality of Izmir, Turkey. Actually, the metropolitan municipality, which is hosting this major event, this big thought and conversation on the evolution of the pandemic that we have been undergoing, actually suffering for more than one year now, a year and a half. And my message is delivered from the European Parliament here in Brussels. And my capacity to talk to you is that I am the chair of the Committee of Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, which is the committee responsible for making laws on fundamental rights of the European citizens, civil liberties of the European citizens, free movement included, managing the external borders of the European Union while making policy and legislation on migration and asylum, judicial cooperation on criminal matters, criminal law in the making and security, of the European citizens. But the point related to the pandemic that we have been suffering for all too long now is precisely that it has made a major impact on free movement, which is the most valuable asset of the European experience ever. Free movement. When you ask the European citizens what is the best of being European, they surely will point their finger on free movement which is a fundamental right. The most valuable asset of the European experience is known by the name of Schengen. And the point is that through the pandemic, the member states of the European Union, which is an experienced rule by law, have resorted to an accumulation of emergency measures adopted unilaterally by member states in order to get control, get hold of the pandemic. And that has made a major impact on free movement. Actually, Schengen has been suspended. It's not that it has not been in 
good shape is that his, it's been severely damaged. That is why we members of the European Parliament, we're representing the citizens of the European Union in all, we're representing the citizens of 27 member states, we have asked the Commission time and again to come up with responses in order to restore a fully functional Schengen on the conviction that there is no recovery from the social and economic impact that the pandemic has brought about to the European citizens' standards of life if there is no restoration of free movement. Without Schengen, without free movement, there will be no full recovery, nor social or economic recovery. But of course, we have to get things back on track while fighting the virus. Yes, it is a fact that fighting the virus takes science, takes pharmacological industry and uh, the vaccination process, which is underway according to the strategy that has been set forth by the European Commission. But it also takes caring about the rights and freedoms we cherish the most, including the right to free movement. That is why we asked the Commission to come with an initiative and the Commission did late April. By late April, we had an urgent procedure in the making in the European Parliament, which means that according to a fast track, in the shortest time possible when it comes to lawmaking here in this European Parliament, we adopted our negotiating mandate, we endorsed the urgent procedure which has been put forward by the von der Leyen Commission, and we engaged in the so-called interinstitutional negotiation, which is called trialogue in the European parliamentary jargon. And through this tense round of negotiations, round the clock, we did have not time to waste, not a minute to waste, engaging in serious negotiation with the Council, making the points of the mandate for negotiation of the European Parliament in order to restore Schengen and free movement. We cared about bringing legal certainty where there has been legal uncertainty, bringing equal rights where there has been discrimination as a consequence of the emergency measures being imposed by the Member States to the European citizens preventing free movement from happening. That is why we insisted that once we have a so-called EU COVID digital certificate, the European citizens will be granted free movement through the borders of the European Union member states. We're talking of a regulation, which means that it's a piece of legislation which is binding for all of the member states, effective as July the 1st, so in time to meet the summer 2021 and make the difference as the summer 2020, which was a total catastrophe, precisely as a consequence of the crumbling down of free movement and the suspension of Schengen. We made sure that once you are given the certificate, then you are given access to free movement. And exceptional measures which are to take place according to the sanitary needs or the needs of public health, which is to be secured by the member states, shall have to be exceptional in their nature, limited in the scope, time framed. So there has to be a duration limited as for the outset and as for the expiration of those measures. And of course, they have to be consistent, not only with the principles of necessity, they have to be necessary. And proportionality, they have to be proportionate to the ends that they are supposed to meet, but they also have to be communicated in due time, in a comprehensible, timely and complete manner to the Commission, which is to report to the European Parliament so that we can exert our scrutiny on the Commission and to the European citizens, which are to be affected with an anticipation to the Commission, 48 hours and to the citizens at least of 24 hours in advance. We also made sure that the Commission would commit itself to make sure that the economic discrimination that has been imposed as a consequence of the restrictions to the free movement requirements of PCRs, requirements of antigen tests, which have been costly in many countries, are to be 
reduced, are to be tackled. That is why the Commission has committed itself to mobilize 35 million euros for antigen tests and at least 100 million euros to lower the cost of the PCRs. But as the vaccination process is making progress, the PCR or antigen test or the serological test, which proves that you have undergone the contagion, the virus, but you have recovered, will be statistically less frequent insofar as vaccination will be the predominant choice to be certified. And that is why we call it a EU COVID certificate, a digital COVID certificate, because it's to be granted gratuitous, free of charge, automatically by the health authorities of every member state or the sub-state levels, the lender in Germany or the autonomous communities in Spain or so the regions in Belgium, they are the ones which are responsible for issuing the certificate, which is to be valid with a unitary content, homogene homogeneous in its format, with three choices, vaccination certificate, PCR or antigen tests, or a serological test that you have recovered from the illness, automatically issued for all the European citizens, free of charge, so that they can get back on the move and make the difference in summer 2020. But also, this certificate is to be consistent with the European standard of data protection, which is the highest in the world, which means that the data are to be minimalized and data are not to travel with the bearer of the certificate. Human beings are to free move, are to freely move, are to move freely, the European citizens are to be back on track to Schengen, fully restored, but the data will not travel with the European citizens because the data will be stored only by the health authority which is issuing the certificate, not by the country of destination of the traveller. And besides, not only the minimalization of data, they have to be secured according to the principles and standards of the EU data protection law. Those were the concerns of the European Parliament while engaging in a tough negotiation with the Council, which went round the clock for two or three weeks so that we could actually deliver and make it in time. By the end of May, we had completed our legislative work. By June the 8th, we had it adopted in a final vote in the European Parliament. Next Monday, we proceeded to the so-called solemn signature. Me as Rapporteur, President von der Leyen, President Sassoli of the European Parliament, Antonio Costa representing the European Council, putting their signatures on the final document so that it'll enter into force and be binding for all the 27 member states July the 1st, making the difference, summer 2021. And a final word, we as legislators, we have been asked many times, what if the vaccination is not everlasting in time? What if the vaccination proves that it has to be renewed in a certain period of time? What if this vaccination is not that as effective as other vaccinations. The vaccinations which are acknowledged in the certificate are the ones recognized by the European Medicament Agency or by the emergency list of the World Health Organization, which is to give also legal certainty to third country nationals coming to the European Union, which are to be granted the same free movement on equal rights as the European citizens so far as their vaccination or certificates are compatible with the ones which are required according to this regulation by the member states, which is directly binding for all the member states. But the answer to those scientific questions that have been addressed to us is that our role is not the role of scientists. Our role is to provide legal certainty where there was legal uncertainty and equal rights where there was discrimination among European citizens. Our role, in short, is making laws, not coming up with scientific answers. That is your task. 
that is the task of this gathering of yours in Izmir, this World Pandemic Congress, which I salute. That is the world of the scientific community, the pharmacological community, to come up with answers and to follow up. This certificate is to be meant valid for one year. There is a sunset clause. In one year, we will have time to redress the situation, we will have time to reassess, and we will have time, if needed, to prolong the effectiveness of this legal piece of legislation, this regulation. But we will be awaiting for the further steps and the developments and the advances which are to be made by the scientific community. That is why I thank you as a lawmaker here in the European Parliament of the opportunity to address you. And we will be appreciating every single step you make in the direction of overcoming this world pandemic of COVID-19 for good. Thank you all. Good day. My name is Dr. Zaid Badruddin and I am the Mayoral Committee member for Community Services and Health in the City of Cape Town. It is a great pleasure to be able to represent the Mother City at this first International Pandemic Conference. Today is day 463 of the lockdown in South Africa. We are currently under lockdown level 3, which enforces a curfew from 10 p.m. until 4 a.m., a limitation on the number of people gathering inside and outside, set at 50 and 100 people respectively. In addition to this, all non-essential businesses are to close at 9 p.m. There are other number of regulations that have not only shut our city's doors to the world, but has had real impacts on the lives and livelihoods of all of our residents in the city of Cape Town. On the 11th of March 2020, the Provincial Department of Health confirmed the first case of coronavirus in our city. The patient, a 36-year-old male, presenting himself to a primary healthcare facility after experiencing flu-like symptoms upon returning from Europe. The confirmed diagnosis marked the start of the pandemic for the residents of Cape Town. We were faced with numerous decisions in an environment filled with uncertainty, an environment at that stage with little scientific data to guide an informed evidence-based response. Information about the virus also was limited at that stage. South Africa faces a quadruple burden of disease, which includes the HIV AIDS epidemic, along with a high burden of t tuberculosis, high maternal and child mortality, high levels of violence and injuries, and a growing burden of non-communicable diseases. It was absolutely necessary for us as a city, guided by the national and provincial guidelines, to act quickly and in the best interest of our residents with a view to protect our economy, our ability to deliver basic services, and also our ability to increase our service provision to vulnerable communities. As a caring and responsive government, we acted quickly. And on the 18th of March 2020, just seven days after our first confirmed coronavirus case, all public facilities were closed in order to introduce an immediate measure to limit the spread of the virus. Following on from our rapid response, other municipalities implemented similar measures until finally the implementation of the National Disaster Regulations um, on the 27th of March 2020, mandating at that stage a three-week lockdown period. Cape Town has experienced two waves of COVID-19 infections, and we have just entered our third wave of infections as of the 14th of June 2021. The first wave began in April 2020 and lasted until mid-September, with the second, more severe wave starting in November 2020 and ending around February 2021. There have been just over 190,000 reported COVID-19 infections in the metro, with 7,800 fatalities. At the beginning of the third wave, we are experiencing about 4,500 active cases at the moment. We are also now entering a period of a rapid increase of active cases. Our metro is divided into sub-districts. Some health sub-districts like Kailicha and Mitchell's Plain had a much greater infection rate in the first wave than the second wave. 
these communities are some of our most impoverished areas in the city and lack strict adherence to quarantine and non-pharmaceutical intervention measures. The sub-districts are also high density, low income suburbs and need to continue to be economically active to survive. South Africa catered for implementing a flexible lockdown level plan based on the COVID-19 surveillance picture. Municipalities are required to enforce these regulations on the lowest community level that is closest to our residents. Generally, these levels adjust the amount of population movement, gatherings and also economic activities which are allowed. As infection risk increases, stricter regulations come into enforcement. This dynamic approach is successful with the proof being that the second wave subsided much quicker than the first following increased lockdown levels. The regulations make it mandatory that non-pharmaceutical interventions are practiced constantly through all levels and make non-compliance a criminal act. The City of Cape Town government has a multi-departmental approach to enforce these regulations and to support the community in adhering to them. The city implemented a data-driven response to aid residents effectively and also invested in developing data tools and dashboards which allowed for a constant stream of visible and value-adding outputs um, to assist with uh, the decision-making. We have certainly seen that the value of making data visible and accessible to the public is essential in driving collective understanding as well as action. The development of public-facing dashboards was a vital aspect of the city's drought response in 2016 and 2017, and we know from experience that shared data will aid us with the pandemic. Over the pandemic period, we have relied on quantitative analysts within line departments who can reason critically and work closely with operational decision makers. We have learned how to use existing data creatively beyond just the purpose it was originally intended to support. Existing data now guides decisions we've never thought we would have needed to make. For example, we have used existing socioeconomic and demographic data sets combined with the burden of disease and comorbidity, comorbidity data and spatial data sets indicating densities and housing typologies to create a vulnerability viewer. This viewer enables the city to view which communities have a heightened risk profile relating to COVID-19. We also had to understand the coronavirus in terms of resilience. We work towards understanding the holistic effects of the coronavirus and responded to it as an acute shock. We defined the disease as a shock because of its nature as a sudden sharp event threatening our city. This government and broader society were ill-prepared at the start to respond um, when it was needed at the beginning. The shock has been compounded by existing chronic stresses that weaken the city's fabric on a day-to-day -day or cyclical basis. The health, social and economic impacts of the pandemic will continue to interact with existing multidimensional risks in communities, particularly vulnerable communities, reducing resilience to them. Broadly, the types of risks prevalent in Cape Town's most vulnerable communities include in terms of health, maternal and child disease, infectious diseases like TB and HIV, non-communicable diseases as well, mostly chronic, as well as a growing caseload of mental disorders including depression and anxiety. Our economic risks include insecure livelihoods, poverty and unemployment. Social risks include crime, gender-based violence, civil unrest, substance abuse. Environmental risks include floods, fires and extreme weather and infrastructurally access to basic services. Building resilience requires viewing the city holistically, understanding the interdependencies between the COVID-19 and existing stresses to adapt and transform in the face of uh, this pandemic. Cross-functional departmental teams that draw on a range of skills and capacities have proven instrumental in allowing the city to leverage its 
full capacity to prevent COVID-19 spread and more recently to support our vaccine program. We have found that crowding and bringing together strategic planning, project management, data science and community engagement as well as communication capacities has provided our city health department with a much enhanced human resource base to plan and ramp up capacity during the pandemic. It has been critical to ensuring the health system remains in a state of readiness and there is a strong emphasis on ensuring it is more resilient at withstanding stresses and shocks over the long term. Resources are now allocated to strengthen continuous surveillance that is critical to identifying infections before they become outbreaks and limit, uh, to limit disease spread. How we manage our facilities are critical to safeguarding the city systems. We focus on building strong stakeholder relations and collaboration with all industries. To secure the health of healthcare workers, the city and province launched what we call the Red Dot Taxis that transported healthcare staff safely to and from work. We also dispersed funeral bookings throughout the week to unblock bottlenecks and assisted with maintaining social distancing and public movement as a result thereof. The fatality chain was placed under immense pressures uh, during the peaks of the infection waves. The City of Cape Town collaborated with the Department of Home Affairs to also streamline the issuing of death certificates to allow for a quicker burial process. As a caring city, it is our responsibility to ensure dignified burials to all of our residents. And as a city, we are mandated to deliver essential basic services and we made provisions to ensure the continuation of service under extreme pressures. The Disaster Risk Management Department implemented the Disaster Coordination Task Team meetings. These planned the continued delivery of essential services that included solid waste management, electricity, water, sanitation, and safety. Like many cities worldwide, Cape Town struggles with the phenomenon of urbanization that sees thousands of people moving into the metro each month. Informal settlements in the city expanded and saw the formation of more than 53 unplanned informal settlements, or as we know it, townships. Our Human Settlement Department implemented basic services to the townships, intending to maintain a healthy environment that suppresses the transmission of the virus. The Informal Settlements Unit maintained and enhanced services in informal settlements that house approximately 200,000 households, delivered temporary services to new unserved informal settlements worth 14,000 homes. Many communities and specific people within Cape Town face several practical barriers to accessing credible information on the vaccine program, registering for the vaccine and also accessing healthcare facilities to receive the vaccination. These barriers will contribute to many persons perceiving the act of getting vaccinated as either too confusing or too risky or too inconvenient. The social and economic isolation of many communities, particularly those in our informal settlements and living on the city's margins, mean that they are cut off from accessing health information and health care and have little to no relationship or trust with the city. In addition, Cape Town has many populations living on the margins of our societies, such as those struggling with drug addiction, those who are undocumented migrants, and those who have previously or currently engaged in illegal or antisocial activities. Bringing information, registration, and vaccination as close to these communities and people groups as possible will go a long way towards overcoming these barriers and expanding the vaccine program's reach into the most vulnerable communities of our city. There has been a substantial uh, volunteer movement since the pandemic began as well, focusing on awareness activities, mask and sanitizer distribution, as well as food aid through our humanitarian programs. These same networks of volunteers will be called upon to support the vaccine program awareness and empowered to do so with frequently asked question documents um, and communication materials, which they can share with their networks. 
as a caring city government, we have realized the importance of leveraging infrastructure and already existing networks within communities, which can support effective communication and coordination of resources, such as community networks and existing communication channels, such as neighborhood watches, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations as well. Our city is now focused on registering our elderly above 60 population for the vaccinations. We are finishing off the vaccination program of our healthcare workers, and we are committed to sustaining a structured interface at the local level between public officials, private sector, and civil society actors to effectively mobilize community resources in support of the vaccine program. A staggered approach to the vaccine rollout has been adopted by our national government as well, with three phases, each phase targeting a different section of the population based on risk. The city is committed to contributing to the national goal of attaining herd immunity. For this goal to be realized in Cape Town, there needs to be a system in place which supports the vaccination of as many people as possible quickly as possible in, re in response to current and future strains of the coronavirus in a manner that prioritizes the most vulnerable and results in as little virus spread as possible. Within the Western Cape, the Western Cape government and the city have sought to co-create a vaccine strategy for phase two and three of the vaccine rollout and a governance structure that will give effect to this strategy. The city has partnered with the Western Cape government to leverage our different institutional resources and relationships so that together the two spheres of government can ensure the vaccine program is a success. The rollout in the Western Cape is under the stewardship of the Western Cape Department of Health. A multi-stakeholder approach is being undertaken to ensure efficient distribution of vaccines to all persons within the Western Cape, whether they be private or public health care users. The city is supporting this rollout in the public sector by aiding in logistics planning, utilization of our public facilities, and also forming part of the vaccination teams throughout city health. The distribution of vaccines will, through a combination of small, medium, and large facilities, ensure that access is available to all of our residents. Vaccinations will be free of charge to all South Africans. The city is also engaging in collaborative communication and social mobilization campaigns, ensuring that the message of vaccination reaches all Capetonians, even the most vulnerable. We have seen that in order to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic and any future pandemic, the following aspects are key for any local authorities to consider in order to protect services and to prevent as well as fight potential pandemics in the future. Firstly, the development of a resilient practice approach and policies informed by acute stresses. Secondly, modernization and utilization of modern and existing data sets. Thirdly, flexible and an agile work uh, team focused on coordination and implementation of basic and relief humanitarian services. Fourthly, enhanced strategic communications focusing on the provision of lives and livelihoods. And fifthly, public participation and shared understanding of the threats and the shocks which are faced. Local governments must be responsive and able to adjust quickly and appropriately to the specific nature of any threat. This is done through coordinated interventions on both a political and an administrative level. The City of Cape Town is prepared to do just that. We will continue to prioritize the health of our residents whilst looking towards the future in which a new normal guides our everyday interactions. I want to thank you and the organizers for the opportunity to present the City of Cape Town's efforts to protect our city and to use these fundamental learnings should the need arise in the future to do so once again. Thank you.